Hello everyone, uh, my name is Somnath Chakrabarti. I am a security researcher at the Intel Labs, uh, based out of uh, Portland, Oregon. And I'm uh, also one of the architects of Intel SGX Technologies. So, so this talk is uh, kind of pure software talk, so bear with me. <laughs> so before that, let's look at what's happening today, right? We have uh, Today's net, telco world and network world, we have fixed function hardware, uh, uh, ASIC based, closed box, nobody knows what's happening inside. But the world is moving towards more of like uh, flexibility, right? So they need software based implementation, they want to virtualize, uh, they want to run it off uh, commercial, uh, just off the shelf hardware. Uh, so now what's happening is you have a fixed function that was running today, tomorrow is going to run on a regular software, regular hardware with standard software interfaces. So what we thought is uh, definitely uh, security needs to be uh, thought of when these functions run as pure software applications on uh, just commercial off the shelf hardware servers, right? So before that, let's look at what does it mean to, to virtualize uh, a hardware appliance, right? Let's say we have some very popular hardware appliances on the left side. What it means to virtualize them or, or, or uh, create a virtual network functions out of them is basically we have to identify or come up with the basic building blocks which most of these popular appliances use like lookup tables, state machines, policy managers, hash tables, filters. These are the building blocks. Now, using these building blocks, what you basically do is you create your virtualized network function. Use the building blocks, connect them the way you want, and there you go. You get one of those uh, virtual functions. But if you want to protect and secure these, you must know how to secure one, uh, the, the building blocks to start with. So before I move into uh, the further, like in, inside the implementation part, let's talk about, uh, there's a technology called Intel SGX. It's available on the, uh, most of the Intel CPUs today that you, you see in the market. It was launched on the Skylake generation. So what it basically does is, I'll just explain. So what it basically does is, instead of running an application on a, on an operating system on a virtualized layer where you have to trust the operating system, where you have to trust the virtualization layer because although your application may be dealing with some sensitive data or secrets or whatever, right, encryption keys, the OS or the VMM at any point of time can look into your memory and see what's going on. That, that's very much possible today. And uh, that's, the, that's the threat we have when we, for example, you, if you're running a, a uh, 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 sensitive app application in the cloud, you don't know who is looking into the memory that uh, your application is using, right? So Intel SGX is a technology using which, what uh, basically you carve out a space. So look at the yellow boxes, the dotted ones. You carve out a space inside your application and tell the Intel CPU, hey, this is the region of my application that is sensitive. I'm dealing with sensitive data inside this area. So when the control or when you execute code inside this application, inside this area, make sure you secure it. And the way you secure it is you encrypt it when the transactions are going outside the CPU. Make sure uh, it's, uh, uh, it, it gives you integrity protection. That means nobody can just play with the data inside even though it's encrypted. And it also gives you uh, uh, protection against replay. That means you cannot just take in some old piece of data, all this encrypted, and put in a new one. Uh, so, how does it help? Most of the software functions here, the building blocks that we talked about, right? It could be protected with Intel SGX because Intel SGX technology is part of the CPU itself. It's not a, a coprocessor where you just have to go and get something done and come back. It's part of your mainstream application. So, now what do you do? 
So you have an application, you have a CPU code to run your application, but how do you make sure uh, that you get uh, uh, a performant application, although it's secure, right? Because there's a notion in the industry, if you try to secure an application, most likely you're not going to get the performance. So there are various ways to design the application. So there's one very naive way of doing it is, hey, uh, you can tell the CPU saying, okay, you run something outside, and whenever you need to uh, uh, get some uh, uh, sensitive data processed, get into that enclave region. We call it the, the protected region enclave. So get into the enclave, do some stuff, come out, and do the untrusted process, continue with the untrusted processing. That's one way of doing it, but that's a bad idea for high-speed packet processing, for example. Because moving in, moving in and out from the trusted world to the untrusted world, it consumes a lot of cycles. The second one is, hey, I have some data I want to process inside the enclave. I don't transfer the entire, the big chunk of data inside the enclave. I just go inside the enclave and tell, hey, this is my data you have to access. Because the enclave can access the outside world, the outside world cannot access the enclave. But that's still bad because you're still going in, in and out of the enclave. Although you're not carrying the data with you, you're still, the control is still going in and out of the enclave. The other solution, the third solution, which is we have some prototypes running on that, is where you said, hey, I'll, I'll use two cores. I'll use one core to do the packet I.O., and I'll keep one core inside the enclave. So you don't have to enter or exit every time. Both cores are running and doing their own job. I'm set, I can set up a lockless queue between them, and that's it. I don't have to, nobody has to exit or enter, but this guy, the outside guy, is continuously doing the packet processing, which is fine. And the inside guy, with the, the guy which is inside the enclave, is doing its regular secure processing. Uh, the last one is more of optimization, where even the core which is inside the enclave can also do I.O. If it's uh, like a DPDK-based I.O. where uh, all the registers, everything is memory mapped, so you don't actually need the outside core anymore. The inside core itself can do it. Okay, so now let's switch. So you must have heard about uh, uh, the OMEC release, right? What basically we tried to do is uh, we looked at the, mob uh, the mobile network code, the EPC, and we said, okay, can we have software implementations of those functions, right? So we have a packet gateway, for example, a service gateway, and we have an MME, and we just <coughs> tried to show that, hey, you can get a performant EPC running on the uh, regular intensity on processor. Question is, can you run it securely? So that's where our focus is now. So let's look at how the, the VNFs that we have released as part of OMEC, how they're connected. They're connected like something like this. It's a very popular way of connecting. Everybody knows how to connect uh, all those components. But let's look at one aspect first, the billing system, right? Billing and charging system. The package gateway generates, sorry, the package gateway uh, generates a lot of billing and charging data because it's going to, it's handling all the user packets. It knows which particular user transacted on which website, how much data was uploaded, how much data was downloaded. All those billing and charging records are generated at the package gateway. Today, the way the telco store, they just store it on a shared storage. And at some point, the billing system just goes and picks that up, processes it, sends you the bill. Now, here's the interesting point. How do you know that the data that was stored in the shared storage was not tampered with? There is no way, there's no way the telco can prove that, hey, I was not, I, I'm not having any malicious intent, I didn't modify anything. There is no way to prove it. What the telcos do today is they encrypt it and keep it. But who owns the encryption key? <laughs> the telco themselves. So the challenge today is when the auditors come in, because there is direct money involved there, right? Public money. When the auditors come in and they challenge the telcos, there is no way to prove that those records have not been tampered with. How did we solve it with SGX? You remove it. Just ignore the green 
boxes, just consider them as a logical representation. Think of a SGX system there. What we do is we get the packets, we get the information of all the, uh, uh, the billing and charging system. We get it through the, a secure channel, SSL based, and we get it into, so, into something called the SGX system. Now what happens here is, this is interesting. The SGX system, when it initializes, the encryption key is randomly generated inside an enclave. And that key never leaves the enclave. And that can be proven by just looking at the code. The key never leaves the enclave. That means me, you, or even the telco has no clue what that encryption key is. They can never access the key. The key is generated inside the enclave. The key is distributed to secure enclaves. For example, the dealer in, dealer out, whoever is processing the data on a, on a mutual trust basis. And the trust is based on, again, SGX attestation, which is another feature of SGX, which, where you can challenge the enclave and say, prove yourself before I can give you anything sensitive. And the key never leaves that, that green box boundary. And that key is used to secure all these records and store it. You now we can store it in any public storage or any, any, any file system. At any point of time, if the auditors come in and challenge, it's very easy. There are some five or six cryptographical steps that you have to follow, and you can prove there's no way anybody could have tampered with it. So that's the billing system. Now what the, uh, in fact, we are, we are working with Sprint and uh, 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 T-Mobile Poland for, for this one. But the interesting question now people are asking is, how about the source itself? The source is not still protected, right? Someone could still go inside the source and say, hey, at the source itself, I will generate false data or some modified data. Now, that's where the interesting things are happening. Today, what we do is, OK, so before that, I'll give you a little bit more details of this is more of crypto stuff. What's, what happens when the SGX dealer systems initialize? What exactly happens uh, when they uh, generate the key? How the keys are exchanged? How the trust relationship between the dealer in, that means the component responsible for getting the billing records, the component that's responsible for transferring the billing records to the billing system, and the key manager here. How they establish the relation, trust relationship, how they exchange keys, it's more of crypto stuff but they do it in a way which, is, uh, uh, which you can cryptographically uh, verify. So that basically means any attacker, there's no way they can attack this channel or the, the dealer components, even the storage, because it, uh, the, all the stuff, are in, uh, it's basically encrypted and uh, integrated, protected, and the auditors have a very uh, uh, algorithmic way to prove the, integrity of the records and the confidentiality of the records. So now, let's look at uh, this, this particular slide. Now, there's one more extra green box you see here. The packet gateway, the SP gateway U, the gateway that's handling the user packets, now we have an implementation where we have, we have secured that with Intel SGX. Because the questions, what? The, uh, the, apart from the question that, hey, the, your source is not protected, apart from that question, the other question people had in mind, hey, SGX, fine, for the billing system, it can handle, how about, uh, how performant will it be when it's running on the packet gateway? And the, the beauty is, if you remember my uh, slide on uh, how you should assign the cores, if you design it the right way, you could get pretty good performance, even on the uh, packet processing plane. So think about this. This packet processing plane is handling user packets. Maybe if you don't just ignore the packets for, for, for now. I mean, the, the packets may be HTTPS protect, I mean, encrypted, maybe going to the internet, you don't care. But what are you doing with the packets? A packet comes in, you look at hundreds of hash table lookups, you do hundreds of hash table lookups, you look at your user information, you look at some headers, replace some part of the packet with some information which you have inside. That part, what you have, what you own inside the, uh, the packet gateway, that's very critical. It has a lot of information. 
And that's something that you definitely want to protect. I mean, today it might be running, this gateway might be running in telco's data center somewhere. But tomorrow it might be running at the edge, somewhere in the, maybe a big shopping complex near the, you know, we, you, you don't know. So it gives you protection not only from software attacks, but also from hardware attacks. So physical attacks, they're not possible because there is no way someone could actually find out what's happening inside that enclave area. There's no way to access it. Software-wise, the operating system, which, who has the highest privilege, the operating system itself doesn't have any way to get inside that particular user space area. So that's where, that's where we are heading to. So performance-wise, here it is. We, what we did is uh, we thought, okay, let's do a simple uh, L2-forward application inside an SDX enclave, which looks at each and every packet against the hash table. And this is the data we have captured so far with a 10 GBPS line rate with 64 byte packets coming in, no difference. I'm talking about a single core performance here. With 20 GBPS line rate, yes. There's some overage here on the SGX, but our goal, and we have been uh, able to achieve our goal, we always make sure that we, whatever the design we come up with, it should, the overage should always be less than 10%. Ten, less than 10% is a sweet spot where you tell someone, hey, you, you're getting performant security, but, uh, uh, and your uh, overage is less than 10%, they're saying, okay, I can accept that. What, what size screen? These are 64 byte packets, yeah. So again, these are lab research numbers. We have real numbers running on, a, uh, on the SP gateway plane, and we uh, pretty much get, uh, 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 two, 2 Mpps uh, or 1.8 or 1.9 Mpps versus the same implementation without SGX is 2 Mpps. So we are pretty close there as well. So with that, where, where are we going? I mean, we are, we did the billing stuff, we did the, the service gate, the SP gateway stuff. What, this, this is our dream, this, this is our goal. We want to secure rest of the VNFs using SGX in such a way that, hey, all those VNFs, they can initialize, they can establish trust relationship between all the others. There is no need for any human intervention when it comes to security. We can keep the humans out, we can keep the physical attacks out, we can keep a lot of the, uh, the, 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 the trusted computing base uh, uh, in our control and keep the rest of the others' components out. So that's, that's our real goal, actually. So with that, the light greens are something which we already have today running. The dark greens we are getting there, starting with the service, the control plane. That's our next target. Uh, MME, definitely. Uh, look at this. This is something which we always wanted to do. The link between the RAN and uh, the, the packet gateway, we want to protect that using SGX. How? You can always say, hey, that's, you can protect with IPsec, but the termination point, the IPsec endpoint, Termi will terminate inside the enclave. So the key to decrypt the packet will be inside the enclave. Is the programming runtime in C, C++ or so, Good question. So what we have is, we have the Intel SGX SDK. By the way, everything required for implementing any SGX SDK-based solution or SGX-based solution is all free. It's all available, it's all, all open sourced by Intel. All you need is SGX-capable CPU, that's all. Runtime-wise, we support C, C++ for SGX SDK. Uh, we recently, re uh, uh, in fact, day before yesterday, we, re uh, we released a framework called Graphene SGX. And Graphene SGX is a tool using which you can run any unmodified application inside an SGX enclave. So what happens is, if you are building an application from scratch today, you can use the SGX SDK. You can figure out here which part of the application I want to protect which part of the application I don't care, and you can separate it out and build your application like that. Fine. Use the SGX SDK, you should be fine. SDK is available both for Linux as well as Windows. Graphene SGX comes into picture where customers or uh, users would say, hey, you know what? My application has been running for five years, stable. I'm sure there's no security issues. I don't want to refactor my application. I mean, it requires a huge effort, right? 
sort of a first order factor, then test. So that I want to run it as this. Graphene SDX solves that problem for you. Graphene SDX says no, no matter what kind of application you have, uh, Python, R, uh, Golang, whatever, C, C++ based application, point me to that application, I will run it inside an SDX enclave unmodified. But there's, a, there's, there's something I, I, I always warn users or customers who wants to use Graphene that you have to keep one thing in mind. If your existing application, because it's unmodified, we are running it unmodified inside SDX enclave, if your existing application itself has a bug inside, you're carrying that bug inside the enclave. So you have to be careful about that. Okay, so with that, uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you.